Mayor said that you know that, but I wouldn't be standing up here doing my job if I didn't remind everyone. Make sure you're doing your good respiratory hygiene. You're washing your hands a lot. You're using hand sanitizer if you don't have access to a sink. Access to a sink. Um, you're taking those precautions to stay home if you're ill, and if needed, contact your health care provider. Call your health care provider and seek advice. And make sure that if you're in those high-risk populations, you have um, extenuating health circumstances, you're elderly, please be staying home um, uh, from the public and staying away from the public as much as possible. Again, like I said, uh, now is the time for us to really continue to step up our actions as a community. And one of the things that we are going to do additionally as the city of Sioux Falls is we are also um, building out our emergency operations center. We've had a planning group that's been meeting for some time here, and now we're going to actually, as of tomorrow morning, open up our emergency operations center, and um, it'll be a multi-agency team with our health systems to make sure that we can continue to work together to manage uh, through this time period and make sure that we're making really good decisions for the community. So, you know, we're, I don't know if lucky is the right word to use, but we're um, somewhat fortunate because we've seen what's been happening in other states in the country and we've been actually, you know, uh, seeing what's happened across the globe. And so we have some there's lessons learned, there's best practices already starting to emerge. Um, just recently we got some new guidance around mitigation strategies for communities which has helped inform us um, today uh, in making the decisions that we are. And so we are gonna be able to uh, make a difference. That's what we do in Sioux Falls, that's who we are. Um, we can do this and um, I have no doubt we can make a positive impact um, for our community. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, one last point of clarification before we open up to questions. Uh, you know, a limit on events and saying we're, we're trying to put a, a cap on events of 250 people, uh, those are at city owned facilities. I can't uh, dictate if a church wants to have church or if other private gatherings want to occur. What we can say is that's the role we're taking and we'd encourage our community partners to follow suit because we think it's a best practice. It's a CDC recommended best practice. Um, so. Uh, I would encourage those who have events coming up like that that aren't in city owned facilities just to think twice about them uh, as we have. Uh, there's some tough decisions we've had to make because of this. Uh, there's some disappointed people because of this, uh, but it's the right move based on um, what Jill just mentioned in terms of a very proactive plan of response. So we have our partners, uh, Dr. Wilde and Dr. Erickson from Sanford and Avera with us as well. So we'll open up for questions that you have uh, for any of us. What do you need to see in the next 14 days to lift these restrictions? You know, I think one of the things we need to see is uh, a slowing of the, uh, the cases that we've seen in the state. So if we feel that uh, we're starting to level off for some reason, um, yeah, we can maybe take a look at it. But we're going to be very cautious on lifting those restrictions. Any more than that, Joe, we also have a lot of events that, uh, large events that are booked out further in advance and they're really watching us. So we don't want to um, uh, be overly in panic mode and uh, hamper some of the events that we have scheduled in our community into the future. So we're starting with 14 days and we'll assess from there. But we're gonna rely heavily on our uh, partners from the healthcare organizations and the, and the State Department of Health to tell us what the trending is and what they feel the community risk is. When you made this decision, did you know that there were going to, I mean, no one just had her press conference and said there were no new cases in the last 24 hours. Did you guys make this decision before that news was known? We did, yeah, we did. Where is your emergency operations center going to be located? Can you tell us about that? It's going to take place right so yeah, I'll, I'll invite Jill up here as well to talk about this um, if you want, but our Emergency Operations Center typically is at our Law Enforcement Center. That's where it will be again uh, for this. That's an ideal location because it allows us to catch the media at our uh, public safety briefings as well for updates. Um, how that typically looks is there's city, county, uh, state agencies in there. Uh, we're going to have our healthcare partners that will have uh, staff there as well so that we're all communicating. We have a public information group. Um, and one of our goals as a city is just to ensure that we, one, 
keep the community safe. That's goal number one. But second, that we continue to provide the services we need to provide to our residents while dealing with what is now labeled a pandemic in, in the U.S. And so, Jill, I don't know if you have anything else you want to touch on on the, the EOC? Okay, so that's how we'll stand that up. All right, Mayor Paul Tenhaken here in Sioux Falls giving us the latest update as to how the city is uh, approaching the coronavirus yeah. and uh, kind of this ever-evolving situation. Right now, you just saw on the screen there, there is a state of emergency that has been declared. It is to run for the next 14 days, and at that point, it'll be assessed. Yeah, so what they're going to be doing as part of that over the next 14 days is that they're going to limit gatherings at city-owned facilities to less than 250 people. So that would be places like the Midco Aquatic Center, the Premier Center, the Washington Pavilion, the Convention Center, the Orpheum Theater, 250 people or more events at those places, they're not going to happen for the next two weeks. We've learned this afternoon already that the Sportsman Show that was scheduled for this weekend That's at Sioux weekend. Falls has been canceled and called off as a direct result of this order that came at the top of the hour. And there are a lot of other events. Uh, you just need to stay informed, whether it's uh, you know something at the local legion or, or your church. NAIA, NAIA championships. Exactly. Yeah. A lot's changing by the minute. So uh, call ahead before you go anywhere if you are sick stay home. Uh, we're going to continue to have more on this as we go throughout the show. In the meantime, we have the latest on all of this as we know it. Uh, cancellations, closures, updates, everything. 12 school in the state for at least three weeks. Here in South Dakota, West Central and Wagner schools are closed for the rest of the week. Other districts, including Sioux Falls, are limiting activities and visitors. And Des Moines schools have also shut down mm -hmm. through the end of the month. Well, as Kelloland's Lauren Solak reports, South Dakota's largest district is also taking extra steps to keep students safe and healthy during this outbreak. Well, Brady and Angela, today the Sioux Falls School District announced it's reducing access to schools and suspending non-essential activities in an effort to reduce the spread of coronavirus. The district is working closely with the state health department. The city and state health officials have um, been in contact with them in the weeks leading up to, to this week and um, on a daily and sometimes more frequent basis than that. Um, and so they have been really helpful in the guidance that they have given us um, in handling this. The school district wants to remind people of the simple measures you can take to keep yourself healthy. We're actually um, you know, working with staff um, to increase um, the number of opportunities students have to wash their hands. Um, we've provided staff with um, um, videos on hand washing um, information to, to increase that and to make sure they're doing it properly. Laura Rader, the principal at Lincoln High School, says custodians are also cleaning thoroughly each night with hospital grade chemicals. Well, it is still flu season too, um, so I think we're pretty sensitive to making sure like doorknobs and the high frequency areas are cleaned. However, I think that's something that we do normally because we do have a, a high population here. And there are still measures being discussed though, including ways the school district might promote social distancing in the classroom. Superintendent Brian Maher wants to remind everyone that the district isn't alone in these decisions. We're getting advice, we're getting wisdom, we're getting suggestions from a lot of, uh, a lot of different places that, that we trust. The Sioux Falls School District is also limiting entrance into the schools to only students and staff. The district plans to keep the community updated daily with new information. Stay up to date with the outbreak on our coronavirus page on Kelloland.com. Thanks, Lauren. Well, we will continue to follow all the latest on the coronavirus in Kelloland. We're going to take a break. Jay Trailbook will be right back with a look at your forecast. And now the Sioux Falls Regional Airport is taking steps to sanitize thoroughly all public areas. Jacob Sersosimo continues our team coverage tonight. Jacob? Hi, Brian and Carlene. Now, this month is one of the busiest of the year at the Sioux Falls Regional Airport and the spring break and vacations. Now, with the coronavirus now in state, the airport is making sure to wipe down and clean everything thoroughly. The airport has been taking steps for the last couple of weeks to wipe down and disinfect all touch areas on a regular basis. That includes handrails, passenger seating, doorknobs, and water faucets, to name a few. Airline companies have been doing their part in the cleaning process as well. Provide additional you know cleaning especially overnight cleaning but you know when the flights are here on the ground 
uh, disinfecting of some of those common touch areas. So, so they're rolling out the, their own processes and procedures for, uh, nationwide for all of their flights. Now, although this week has been busy and flight numbers have been normal, they expect the number of flyers to go down next week. And I'll have more on this story tonight on Dakota News Now on KSFY at 6. Live at Sioux Falls Regional Airport, I'm Jacob Sersosimo, Dakota News Now. Jacob, thank you. A number of universities taking precautions against this coronavirus outbreak. Augustana University is extending spring break for students through Friday, March 20th. No classes will be held during that time. However, faculty and staff will conduct normal business operations. Classes are expected to resume on Monday, March 23rd. And just within the last hour, the South Dakota Board of Regents have extended spring break for all of South Dakota's six public universities through March 20th in response to the coronavirus. Phil is going to be back in just a moment with a check in your forecast. Hey, if you just want a slice of pizza, you don't buy the whole... They do shifts, working uh, three shifts. What would you, what's your advice? You know, at this point, our, our strongest advice is that people that are sick need to stay home. Those companies that are in areas where we're having significant cases, if they can, you know, telework, uh, we're recommending that. Those companies that are aware of cases, we're asking for social distancing. We're not asking for everybody to come at the left. Working uh, three shifts. What would you, what's your advice? You know, at this point, our, our strongest advice is that people that are sick need to stay home. Those companies that are in areas where we're having significant cases, if they can, you know, telework, uh, we're recommending that. Those companies that are aware with cases, we're asking for social distancing. We're not asking for everybody to come at the lunchtime and sit at the same table. We put out a series of guidelines, but what we're not advocating you know, and obviously individuals that just returned from Italy or France or Germany, we'd like them to stay home for 14 days. Uh, but we're not advocating the use of these tests in a, in a broad way in the absence of uh, a relationship with a physician or public health official to make that determination. Um, second question, we've got probably 80 people in this room. Uh, the questions that I'm getting getting asked what are the in this room today what are the likelihood I don't know what who I don't know who's got what in this room walk me through the um, the likelihood of any one of us in this room uh, getting the, the virus assuming somebody here has the symptoms again still the real risk uh, in, in in general right now this is why the president took the action he did last night um, Within the world now, over 70% of the new cases are linked to Europe. And in the United States, I think it was now 35, 30 states in our country, 30, of our, uh, 30 states or more were, were linked actually to cases of Europe. Europe is the new China. And that's why the president made those sta uh, statements. Um, clearly, we can only continue to emphasize the, the basics that we've all said about washing your hands, Obviously, staying away from people who are sick, learning how to cough correctly, don't touch your face, although we all know it's very complicated uh, you know, to try to uh, not touch your face during the day. But I think it's really important that we also are moving quickly with uh, broader mitigation strategies based on the virus, and Tony may want to add to this. So some of that is really encouraging social dis distancing in the workplace, really encouraging social distancing in restaurants, really encouraging social distancing at sporting events. So, Tony, you want to add? Yeah. So, sir, it's a great question because you're right, everybody's asking it. And the issue is, in the spirit of staying ahead of the game, right now, we should be doing things that separate us as best as possible from people who might be infected. And there are ways to do that. You know, we use the word social distancing, but most people don't know what that means. For example, crowds. Uh, we just heard that they're going to limit access to the Capitol. That's a really, really good idea to do. I know you like to meet and press the flesh with your constituencies. Not, I think that, you, not now. I, 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 think you need, I, need, I think you need to really cool it for a while because we should, we should be practicing mitigation even in areas that don't have a dramatic increase. 
I mean, everyone looks to Washington State, they look to California, they're having an obvious serious problem. But their problem now may be our problem tomorrow. So we've got to act like there's going to be a problem. And that means doing everything you possibly can to do the guidelines that the CDC puts up, which sound very simplistic, but they're really important. Common, common sense. Common sense, yes. Finally, I know when this first became public, you, we, uh, I think this country had test kits out to, in, in an effort to find a vaccine to those willing, I guess, to be tested. Where are we on that? I want to just sort of stress the complexity of getting tests, as we've heard from a number of your colleagues, is not just about having the reagents that CDC originally made for a test. Um, you, you obviously need that test kit, and we've put out in the public health system over 75,000, so the public health labs have that. But the public health labs actually have to have the people to do the test, and what is their capacity to do the test? They have to have the equipment to do the test, and what's the capacity of the equipment they have? They have to have some of the early reagents that they need, uh, not to get too technical, but you've got to extract nucleic acid in order for the test to go into our kit. So there's a whole system that we can see that there's different you know, limitations as we expand, expand, expand. CDC, I tried to explain why we used the system we did, which is a, uh, you know, a thermocycler system, which is not a system that you can do you know, ten, uh, tens of thousands of tests very easily. You're really limited. Do what we need to do. The head of U.S. forces in the Middle East says an Iranian-backed militia likely launched the attack that wounded an additional dozen coalition troops. Its economy remains strong. <clears throat> the president is continuing to take action himself. We just passed billions, billions, in urgent funding just last week, and the Senate will continue to stand ready and willing to work toward further bicameral bipartisan actions when the House Democrats decide to get serious. Now, yesterday, Madam President, the World Health Organization officially declared COVID-19, known as the coronavirus, a pandemic saying that it was, quote, deeply concerned both by the alarming spread and severity and alarming levels of inaction by the nations of the world. Let me repeat that. They were deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and the alarming levels of inaction by the nations of the world. In my home state of New York, members of the National Guard have arrived in New Rochelle this morning to clean institutions and deliver food to the more than 120 sick residents within the three mile containment area. Here in the capital, public tours will be suspended and by the end of the week, the capital complex will be restricted to official business only. And today, the House of Representatives will take up and pass several measures that the speaker and I called for earlier this week to alleviate the economic pain felt by American workers and families that are impacted by the coronavirus, including extension of paid sick leave, food security insurance, and an expansion of, of unemployment insurance. The legislation will also provide much needed help to states like New York that are overburdened by Medicaid costs by temporarily modifying the FMAP formula it gives the states the flexibility and money they need to fight with this fight this problem. I have long fought for an increase in FMAP funding, and this is welcome and needed for New York. I'm glad it's in the bill that Democrats in the House and Senate put together. Now, many of the policies that I've mentioned have been enacted by other countries dealing with the coronavirus. The policies are targeted at workers and families that are directly impacted by the virus, which is exactly where the focus needs to be. Not on bailing out oil and gas companies or the cruise industry or deregulating banks. Some of the ideas under discussion at the White House by all reports, but on helping the American people cope with the crisis. That is job number one. We can come back and pass additional targeted measures 
that deal with other economic problems at a later date. But in the immediacy of today, the policies that we, that the House will pass, will provide much needed help to those who need help. It will provide significant economic relief by pumping money into the economy. And it will provide some flexibility to the localities, the states, and to the American people. The Senate should pass this bill immediately following the House before the end of the day. I plead, I plead with my Republican Senate colleagues to pass this bill now. It has been carefully thought out. Its programs are directly aimed at people. They're not ideological. And it is desperately needed to show the American people that we can do things that actually benefit the people who are in trouble and actually help move the American economy. To not pass this bill today would be a dereliction of duty. And I plead with Senator McConnell, put the bill on the floor. Let there be a vote. It will pass in my judgment. Put the bill on the floor. Do not let this legislation that the House passes at a time of crisis be just another tombstone in your legislative graveyard. Now, of course, the central problem remains. If we do, there will be some court challenges on that front, but otherwise, uh, there are sweeping powers for the government here. Uh, you know, Governor Inslee was speaking quite starkly this week in Washington, and we just heard from a mayor there, uh, about penalties, and he made a broader point. I mean, you're speaking to the fact that there's plenty of authority for a actual bona fide, justified public health emergency, um, but he spoke about something higher than, than the law. Take a listen. How far does this extend to personal events like parties, like weddings, like funerals, and then what are the penalties exactly for not abiding by the ban? The penalties are you might be killing your granddad if you don't do it. And I'm serious about this. What do you think about that and the way government officials try to instill seriousness uh, within the law without that, panic? That's 100% right, Ari. I mean, yeah, there are penalties for violating all of these different government restrictions, but at the bottom, this shouldn't be about penalties. This is about your own conscience and what you're willing to do and what you're willing to risk. And anyone, you know, we're all in this together, and we all have to do everything we can to avoid the spread of the disease and flatten the curve. The law is a piece of it, but it's the tiniest piece of it. It's all about our individual actions. Um, and so I think the governor got it exactly right. You know, this is why we're also very different than China. You know, China, in addition to the movement restrictions, they're literally tracking everyone's cell phones, WeChat and other things, so they can determine if anyone's moving uh, out of the restricted areas or into the restricted areas. They can go and get them with their military. Um, and, you know, we don't want to go down that path. And we're a country of liberty and freedom, but we're also a country in which we view ourselves as having a communitarian responsibility to one another. And we shouldn't need the law to do this. We shouldn't need apps to be tracked or mm -hmm. anything like that. But if it comes to that, unfortunately, you know, fortunately, the government does have powers to, to do things like impose movement restrictions. Uh, Neil Kotjall, with uh, a lot of context here, thank you so much. I want to remind everyone, you can always go to msnbc.com slash opening arguments. We'll have this segment there later tonight on coronavirus and the law, as well as Neil's past reporting and analysis. Meanwhile, a lot of Americans finding that this hits home when you hear about people you care about, if not in your community. What about famous people you know about? Tom Hanks and his wife publicly announcing they have coronavirus, they got tested in Australia, also puts more pressure on why it's so hard to get tested right here in the U.S. We're back on that and much more in 30 seconds. There's a company that's talked to even more real people than me. J.D. Power, 448,134 to be exact. They answered 410 questions in eight categories about vehicle quality. And when they were done, Chevy earned more J.D. Power Quality Awards across cars, trucks, and SUVs than any other brand over the last four years. So on behalf of Chevrolet, I want to say thank you, real people. You're welcome. We're going to need a bigger room.
We're back with breaking news here, and it's all about responses to the coronavirus. Since we came on the air, Delaware has joined the many states declaring states of emergency, the 20th state to have done so. You can see we're keeping track on several of the ways that you can understand this and keep it in context, as we've been saying throughout the evening. Facts, not panic, but over 1,500 cases and quite the market crash today as well. All of this putting pressure on the federal government and how Donald Trump is leading. Here he was today. Stay away from uh, people and wash your hands and do all of the things that we're supposed to be doing a little bit anyway, but it'll be, uh, it'll go very quickly. I'm joined now by Congressman Ami Barra from California, who is also a doctor. Good evening. Good evening, Ari. Uh, what is important to know here uh, as we move forward, uh, the president spoke last night, uh, issued a, a, a type of travel ban, said some things that had to be corrected. What do you want uh, your constituents and the rest of the viewers to know? Look, let's take this seriously. The, the president often um, undermines our own message of how serious this is. This will get worse before it gets better. That said, the vast majority of folks are going to be fine, but we've got to be vigilant here. We as Congress have to get our act together. There are a lot of vulnerable folks that you know, are one paycheck away from being evicted. There are a lot of vulnerable folks that don't have paid family leave. Let's take politics out of this. Let's address the urgency of now. Let's put those safety net services in there for the uninsured folks so they can go get tested if they're concerned. And let's actually fix this testing problem. You know, it would almost be better if the president didn't get on television right now because I think he is undermining the urgency of now we can do this, we can get ahead of it, but we've got to all be on the same page. Well, which is it at this point? Uh, because some of his critics and Democrats have said he's played it down too much. Then as of last night, some are saying he's overreacting uh, with uh, the partial travel ban. Well, so what we know is a travel ban right now is not going to do a whole lot to mitigate things. It may slow things down a little bit, but coronavirus is now community spreading. It's throughout um, the United States of America. Six weeks ago when he, you know, he did the China travel ban, that probably bought us a little bit of time. Unfortunately, they squandered that time. That's when we should have been developing testing capabilities, getting equipment out to the hospitals and public health centers, et cetera, and that just didn't happen. Um, they've slow played this. That's fine. Listen to Dr. Fauci when he says, you know, this was a mistake. You know, we've squandered things. Now let's get our act together. Let's come together. This isn't political. This isn't partisan. We've got to do our jobs as Democrats and Republicans, reassure the public, but let the doctors and the scientists do what they've got to do. Why is testing such a problem from a policy perspective? You know, we're frustrated. The administration cannot answer the question why it is taking us so long to get testing capabilities up and running when South Korea can do 10 to 15,000 tests a day. I would tell the, um, the CDC to pick up the phone, call that South Korean company that's um, creating these tests, ask them if we can get that licensing, and let's start creating those tests here. This is not about ego or anything else. This is about getting the capabilities to, out to the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, the public health workers that are on the front lines that are going to keep us safe and help us get ahead of this. Uh, Congressman Barra, thank you so much. Uh, we want to dig as well deeper into the testing issues and how to fix them. We have a doctor in Washington State when we come back. Actor Tom Hanks now is quite clearly the most famous American to contract the coronavirus. Testing positive while in Australia, as the New York Times notes, though, tests there are widely available and free. A marked contrast to the United States, where test kits have been hard to find. There are not enough for people who need them. A fact that the government's own science leaders admit. The system does not, is not really geared to what we need right now what you are asking for. That is a failing. And a that failing, yes. It, it is a failing, I mean, let's admit it. The okay. idea of anybody getting it easily, the way people in other countries are doing it, we're not set up for that. Do I think we should be? Yes, but we're not. 
you are looking at the process of congressional oversight where people from the administration have to say under oath what the facts are. They also have private briefings and lawmakers who received one also speaking out on what they're learning about our capabilities as a country to deal with coronavirus. I think we are all very concerned about the spread, about the lack of testing. The reality is, and we are told by the experts, that they do not yet have the tests available and can't give us a, a date that they will be. We're not the best equipped nation in terms of testing. That's, that's absolutely obvious. I think generally speaking, our public health system and our system of hospitals and experts and doctors is, but we have a serious deficiency in being prepared for testing. South Korea, for example, is doing a better job. About 11,000 people have been tested thus far in the U.S. South Korea, which you just heard mentioned, tests 10,000 people daily. Experts say several factors lead to this failing. We were just discussing this. We want to bring you some more context. Flaws in the initial test kits sent by the CDC last month, that compromised critical early stage efforts. The Trump administration also declining offers of a test developed by the World Health Organization, instead basically, quote, going it alone. Then weeks ago, Trump administration officials blocking efforts by doctors out in Washington state to use their own tests because, and this can be a consideration, of course, but those tests were not at the time FDA approved. One of those Washington state doctors, though, joins me right now, Dr. Alex Greninger, assistant professor at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. Uh, good day to you. Explain, um, hi, hi, explain to us uh, the context here and the balancing of things that in a non-emergency setting might make sense, like waiting uh, versus the situation we're in. Right, so uh, on February 4th, the FDA offered an a EUA for the CDC, that's emergency use authorization for the CDC test. And part of that emergency use authorization and the, the laws around that basically uh, did not allow uh, hospital labs and clinical labs to begin to, to uh, perform testing until they also had received emergency use authorization. And the FDA has a, clear, uh, has a clear interest in this, and we do too, for having accurate testing, which is very important. The problem is, is that created a monoculture, which the CDC test, unfortunately, had one bad primer set. Um, and it took three weeks to fix that issue. And so it wasn't until the last week of February where we were able to um, both fix the CDC kit, and then on February 29th, the FDA allowed the go-ahead for clinical labs such as ours uh, to begin to perform testing. So is that how the system's supposed to work, or do you have a criticism uh, embedded in, in, in that history? Well, I think there are a few things that could be fixed, but I also think that any country that has um, come in contact with this virus has been caught unaware. Yeah. I mean, it's a very difficult virus. It transmits very, uh, very efficiently. Uh, it has a high morbidity and mortality. Every country that's come in contact with this virus has not made peace with it. They've decided to fight. What would making peace involve? Well, I mean, like with flu, it's not peace, really, but it's just like with flu, we kind of, we, we get vaccinated, but we sort of, you know, still go about economic activity, right? We don't, we don't, the, the market hasn't dropped 10% for respiratory syncytial virus. Um, but with this particular virus, uh, we are, we, the China, Italy, you can see the response of these countries to this particular virus. It has a high morbidity, high mortality rate. It seems that you're gesturing towards the cycle. Dr. Fauci, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. I want to ask you about what you said today before Congress, that our system is failing. How? Alterated differently over time. The system of testing was originally designed for a doctor-patient type of interaction where you go into a doctor's office or a clinic with symptoms and the reason you want to test is either you've been exposed or you have symptoms. That goes to a public health laboratory that the CDC made the test for. It works very well for that. But what it doesn't work for is if you want to do broad blanket type of screening to answer the question that so many people are asking, how many people in this country are infected? That system now is going to be up and running, I would, I would imagine, really quite soon, probably in a week. Will that be too late? No, I, I don't think there's things like too late, but what we can do right now is the kind of what we call both containment and mitigation. Those are the things you do to stop spread. Though, therefore, I don't like to say it's too late. It certainly is not too late. We had a viewer write in that her sister has a low-grade fever, she has a cough, but the doctor won't test her for coronavirus because she doesn't meet the quote-unquote government standards. 
What are the well, standards well, and why can't she get a test? Well, uh, well, I must tell you, Nora, for sure that that is a misunderstanding of what the standards are. The standards used to be more stringent. They are much more relaxed right now. Are you sure that that message is getting to doctors? Well, obviously it may not be because you're just giving me an example of how that message didn't get out. I think we need to do a better job of getting that message out. Hopefully my talking to you today will be a, you know, going a step in that direction to get that message out. We know the symptoms of COVID-19 are dry cough, fever, and shortness of breath. <clears throat> if someone has those symptoms, should they go to the emergency room? No. Thank you for the question. They should stay home call the health care provider, call their physician, or even call the emergency room and say, these are the symptoms that I've had. I'm staying home. What can I do to get a test? And then you will get instructed about what the proper, safe way to do that. Dr. Fauci, America has changed so rapidly in the last week. When is life going to get back to normal? How long is this going to last? You know, Nora, we don't know how long it lasts. If you look at what's happened in China, they went way up and they're starting to come right down now. The Korea curve is peaking. It's starting to kind of flatten out. So you usually measure in a matter of several weeks to a couple of months. Well, Dr. Fauci, good luck with all your efforts and thank you so much for the information. Good to be with you, Nora. There is still much more news ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News. Uh, having this facility within our city will enable us to accelerate testing and increase the volume of testing. That's very important. But people who want to test still need to go through their doctor or health care provider. They can't simply show up there. There are protocols that the state has established in order to prioritize testing. And that is necessary as long as demand for testing exceeds supply. We have to make sure that the testing is targeted in the most effective way possible. The new Rochelle uh, Mayor and Noam Bramson. Uh, Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good to be with you. All right. Thank you. Just ahead, uh, games canceled, seasons suspended. We'll take a closer look at the ripple effect. Clock tomorrow night and into around 8 o'clock in some... In home isolation after a teammate tested positive for COVID-19. And the wife of Canada's Prime Minister now showing symptoms after a trip to the UK. The Trudeaus now both in isolation, waiting for their results. And in the UK, a dark warning from Prime Minister Boris Johnson about what lies ahead. Many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time. And late tonight, France's president echoing that alarm, closing all schools and universities, calling it the most serious health crisis France has faced in a century. And so let's get to James Longman with us again tonight. He's from self-quarantine there in London. And as we've been reporting here for days now, it was suggested upon landing back in the UK after reporting from Italy three times for us. Authorities suggested to James that he self-quarantine, so that's what he's doing. Uh, James, you reported tonight that Italy, it's still believed, is two weeks from its peak. And these numbers were really telling. From the World Health Organization, uh, it says that Italy has more hospital beds and doctors per capita than the U.S. does, and the U.S. is just beginning to deal with this, a bit of a warning sign, what we're seeing in Italy. Yeah, that's right, David. So with the virus still yet to peak in Italy, they are being overwhelmed, the sheer number of people needing help. And it is a wake-up call, given that Italy has perhaps more beds than the United States per capita. David? Yeah, it certainly is a wake-up call, James. Thank you. And so you heard that tonight about hospital beds in Italy, and that country is still overwhelmed. And so when we come back tonight, Dr. Jen Ashton, on um, whether hospitals here in this country will be able to handle it, the wave of cases now expected here at home. And Dr. Jen, answering your questions, it is cold and flu season already, so how do you know when your symptoms could be coronavirus? When to call your doctor will be on the list. We're also following... Because this is the count that informs where hundreds of billions... ...powered by Verizon 5G Ultra... ...as soon as I can. Well, as soon as you, I can, you can, hopefully will be today. The system does not... is not really geared to what we need right now, what you are asking for. That is a failing. The okay. idea of anybody getting it easily, the way people in other countries are doing it, we're not set up for that. Do I think we should be? Yes, but we're not. Okay, that's really disturbing and I appreciate the information. Some of the Q&A up on Capitol Hill, uh, as we look at the numbers, the coronavirus in the U.S., uh, 46 states plus the District of Columbia, 
1,444 cases, 37 deaths. Uh, there you see Washington, California, Florida, New Jersey, South Dakota, and Georgia. 29 of those deaths coming in the state of Washington. Let's bring in our panel, Josh Holmes, former top advisor to Mitch McConnell, now president of Cavalry Consultants, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, and Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. A lot has changed over the past couple of days in how the country has reacted, how this place, Washington, D.C., has reacted. Thoughts about this evolution that we've seen? Well, first off, I just want to say I love watching Anthony Fauci testify. He's, it, he's really a sense a calming voice. He'll tell you when things are going well, he'll tell you when things are not going well, and it makes you feel like you can trust him. Uh, clearly, people are very concerned about what's happening now, and I think it is, it's good that people are concerned and that they're changing their behavior in a public health crisis that requires changed behavior. What's more concerning, I think, is that a lot of powers that be have not thought through the other issue with public health crises, which is that serious damage to the economy can cause serious damage that I don't think people are thinking through as well as they could. It would be nice to see people be concerned about the public health while also being concerned about not inducing people toward panic that can really hurt people who are in jobs that rely on you know, in the service economy, waiters, retail workers, these types of people through no fault of their own might be facing some serious economic hardship. You know, I've mentioned with uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez about the H1N1 uh, virus and how it was dealt with. I think it was 17,000 people um, died. It is a compare contrast a bit, um, and it's the most recent, I guess, of the pandemics. You know, I don't know what it is about the number 11, but 311, uh, March 11th yesterday, when the WHO declared the pandemic will probably go down in history as the moment when our society kind of capitulated to this threat all of a sudden, a lot of people were holding back on certain decisions, made them. So we have all the school closings cascading now. We had the president go into the Oval Office and give the speech that he had not given. Uh, Congress uh, this morning decides, you know what, maybe we won't go on recess. And the reason for that is that they have judged, I think at the advice of people like Mr. Fauci, that the downside risk here is substantially greater than it was with H1N1. And to be fair, we really don't know. We don't have the parameters. We don't have the data, solid data about the fatality rate. And that's a fair with. criticism, right? I mean, well, for this administration, for the last, for this one, why we don't have the test kits, the test ability, the, the, the testing, testing ability. That's absolutely true, is that, is that the, the testing has been a flop here. But I think what Dr. Fauci was trying to point out is that our history of diagnostic testing in this country, our method, so to speak, is you go to your doctor's office, you get a test, they mail you the result as an individual. We're not set up to do it in parking lots like they were doing in South Korea. And that is a failing uh, that we're going to have to correct. Josh, meantime, uh, Capitol Hill, take a listen to the speaker and the House Minority Leader on this bill. We're negotiating oh, with um, Secretary Mnuchin. He had some suggestions, all very reasonable. I think that none of them is a... Uh, would p prevent us from moving forward with the bill. We are working with the White House, with uh, Secretary Mnuchin, and with the Speaker. Um, we should not just take a rush just because there's a bill. We want to make sure it works. So there is a little pumping in the brakes, but not too much. I mean, it seems like something like this is going to move. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of optimism tonight. That Today might be the day when it really came home to people uh, uh, that things are going to be different for a while. Um, and, and the big unknown is we don't know for how long, but, but just the list of, of, of things that happened today, last night and today, that, that, that you ran down. I mean, no March Madness, no uh, professional sports leagues, Major League Baseball is putting off uh, opening, uh, opening day and, um, and, and won't have crowds at the, at the spring training games. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not just the sports leagues, but those really, folk, they get your attention, yeah. right? Uh, and so many people are working from home, as I did today, because at the Washington Post, that's the policy now. Now, if you if you're able to work from home, please do. Um, uh, there's hand sanitizer everywhere. We're all washing our hands, and I think what we need is um, uh, what I wish we had is a better narrator than we mm. have. Well, let me right ask now. you about that because a word that is so overused in politics and and culture, certainly mm -hmm. the movies that are being canceled, mm -hmm. is sacrifice. 
Um, okay. How much do people need to think about this, um, even with the inequities that we've covered on this very broadcast, as a time where maybe some of the stuff we got to put up with is sacrifice for our greater good and what we owe each other? Well, I, I think it's, that's a lot of it because, let's face it, most of us don't know anyone who's, who's been infected with the coronavirus or who suffered from COVID-19 and, and we read the stories and we see the numbers of cases which thankfully um, uh, appear small, mm -hmm. that's actually partly because we haven't done the testing, but, um, uh, and, and so there's, a, I think, a natural tendency to say, you know, why am I turning my life upside down for this? And there's a, there's a very good answer. There's a very, very good answer. We've seen what happened in, in China. We've seen what happened in Italy. We, we, we know what can happen if we allow our medical system to get overwhelmed, and that's what we have to worry about. Uh, Eugene, we had you on the breaking news at the top of the hour, but this is a fitting thing to reflect on. Uh, as always, we appreciate your words, not only in writing, um, but right here on MSNBC. Uh, thank you, sir, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to everyone watching The Beat tonight. We'll be back with one more thing.